thanks to those who are joining us here at the Wisconsin Energy Institute, and thanks to those uh, joining online. Um, if this is your first time joining for one of our seminars, my name is Scott Williams. I'm the Research and Education Coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. And the Sustainable Energy Seminar is a program that we do every other uh, Monday in the fall and the spring semesters. Um, and the goal is to highlight cutting edge energy research from across UW Madison and beyond, uh, and to showcase how different disciplines understand energy challenges and develop solutions. So throughout the series, we hear from folks in science and engineering and social sciences and humanities uh, with the goal of learning about the ways in which they view sustainable energy challenges and develop solutions. Uh, the seminar is open to the public um, and it's also a course for students in the undergraduate certificate in engineering for energy sustainability, as well as the master's program in sustainable systems engineering. Uh, these seminars are, uh, are presented in a hybrid format, so you can always join us here at the Wisconsin Energy Institute uh, or join uh, through Zoom webinar. Uh, live captioning is available uh, for those that are joining through Zoom, and uh, you can click on the show captions button to turn that feature on or off. Um, if you're joining us online, uh, please use the Q&A uh, box, um, and I can interrupt our uh, presenter anytime uh, if you have any questions or need clarification um, and uh, direct those questions to him. Um, for those in the room, um, I can pass the mic off to you or um, we'll turn the ceiling mics on during the Q&A portion as well um, to ask questions. Um, yeah, and with that, we'll uh, introduce our guest speaker for today. Um, this might be an area that folks who are not affiliated with the Wisconsin Energy Institute or Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center are familiar with, but I think it's an exciting area to, to understand and um, you know learn about uh, something that maybe isn't as uh, familiar uh, to folks. Uh, so Kevin Myers is a scientist in the Donahue and Noguera labs at the Wisconsin Energy Institute and the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. And he's a computational and bioinformatics scientist uh, where he analyzes multi-omic data to determine how to use individual microbes and microbial communities to produce biofuel and other valuable bioproducts from non-food-based plant uh, biomass that is grown on marginal lands, which is uh, a lot of pretty much the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center wrapped into one sentence. Uh, he also develops tools and pipelines. Members of the scientific community, both within and beyond GLBRC, can more easily analyze large data sets. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'll just say before, yeah, feel free to interrupt. It can be really informal to discuss this, especially if you're not used to any of the microbial community uh, stuff that I'll be talking about. Um, so just a little bit more background, I got my PhD in microbiology across the street in Trisha Kiley's lab studying E. coli, and then I did a postdoc with Audrey Gash across another street uh, studying yeast, and then I crossed a third street, and I've been in the GLBRC working with Tim solely computationally for the last five and a half-ish years. So the story I'm going to tell you about is one of the projects that we worked on over the years, and it's uh, been published. I'll give the, the citation at the end. Uh, but it's a really interesting way of using microbial communities to take leftovers or what people who aren't in the business would call waste and turn them into valuable products and uh, provide another revenue stream for industries who want to produce uh, biofuels from the uh, GLBRC uh, idea. So why should anyone care about this? Well, you've probably seen a chart like this before. You can see the weather outside, it's 60 degrees on February 26th, it's you know, not, not typical. And so we're pumping in carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at alarming rates. Uh, this chart was from uh, NOAA 2022, 4.17. The average is much higher than it has been at any point in history. And of course that has uh, climate impacts namely this uh, temperature. And so you can see this is, you know, it cuts off there in the black and these are predictions. So RCP is, uh, those different numbers just mean how much change we could attribute, what the predicted change in temperature would be. So if we don't do anything in the red, you can see that temperature change is gonna be enormous versus if we do something more in the blue or the green, we could maybe stable out, uh, stabilize this temperature change and, and, and hopefully prevent at least some of the catastrophic environmental impacts that climate change uh, will, will bring. And so this is where the GLBRC comes in. 
So one thing we want to do is put less carbon into the atmosphere, right? That's a good uh, starting point for, for a, a green uh, group like us. So what, what are ways we can do that? And here's just a, a, a figure I stole from my boss, Tim. And this has different ways to generate electricity, generate energy, generate chemicals without using petroleum-based products and being in a carbon, carbon neutral or carbon negative environment. So we have wind farms. We all know wind farms. We have solar. This actually is a, an example of a floating solar panel in the middle of a reservoir. So you could do hydropower from that reservoir. But where GLBRC comes in is on the right side there. And here, the idea of GLBRC is that we grow energy crops. We put them, we, we transport them to local biorefineries. We use microbes to produce energy, fuel, or biofuels, and chemicals. And we do that in a carbon neutral way because we grow more energy crops to pull out any carbon that we pump into the atmosphere. And so we like to use this term, a, a decarbonized uh, bioeconomy. And so biomass is one of the things, uh, one of the aspects to that. And that's what GLBRC is, the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center is involved in. So the uh, Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center and the Wisconsin Energy Institute is, is the building we're in. Uh, the GLBRC is funded by the Department of Energy. We're in our 17th year of existing. And uh, we are set out to use microbes, to generate basic science of using microbes to take non-food plant products and produce fuels and other valuable products uh, that normally are produced from petroleum. And so we are primarily housed here at UW-Madison. We also have a large portion at Michigan State University. Uh, and, and then we have a, a smattering all over the place. There's one in Canada, there's some down in Tennessee, um, and, and uh, some on the East Coast. But what we really want to do is, is, is shown in this little cartoon here. So we start with these bioenergy crops. So the two that we work on now is it's not corn. There's no corn anymore. There's no food. We use switchgrass and primarily, and the other big one is poplar trees. We use those because they can grow on land that is not super prime for crop development. So we don't want to compete with food. They also grow quickly and produce a ton of biomass. And so we grow these up, we harvest them, and then we process them in a way to break them down into components of polysaccharides and these lignin polymers. Then we treat with, uh, we break them down further into sugars and these aromatics. We can use microbes at this point to produce biofuels and bioproducts. And this is just an example then of what kind of money we can make from this. And so we think that, so a gallon, you know, a barrel of oil, this is a, a representation of, of a barrel of oil and everything that's made from petroleum. So we know diesel and gasoline make up over 50% of that, but then there's jet fuel, there's chemicals, and there's a bunch of other stuff, right? Chemicals could be anything, right? Plastics. Nearly every plastic is made from oil. But when we think about money. And so one thing we do in the GLBRC is we try to think about what can we prime industry, not only to make biofuel, but also what else can we give them so that when they do this, they don't lose a bunch of money. They actually can make money. So if we look, we make 50% of the money that uh, an oil company makes is on the fuels, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. The other 50% is on that teeny tiny part up there that are chemicals. And so I'm going to talk more about the chemicals in the talk, but I just wanted to show this that our what we call techno-economic analyses that I don't do, other, other people do, but they show that there's advantage to using all the parts of the plant to make not only fuels but chemicals as well, to make a bunch of different valuable products that, that companies can use to make money. And so this process is called lignocellulosic fermentation. So lignocellulose just means not corn kernels, right? We have to break down the plant material and get to the sugar and the aromatics in there. And this is a good case study for, um, for this kind of analysis. So let's go into a little more detail here. And this is where we're getting into things that go on in this building upstairs. And so this is uh, a fermentation pipeline that can produce 
uh, biofuels. And so we start, there's poplar and switchgrass, those, those cute little cartoons. We break those down using ammonia and heat and pressure, and we get, we get what we call plant hydrolysate. And so that's in that little, um, we can feed it microbes, and that's, called a, that's a bioreactor that just lets us control the input and output of media and cells and product and, and so on. And so we add to that a couple of microbes. And so in the center, we use two microbes to produce our biofuel, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is just brewer's yeast that we've engineered and evolved to, to produce different chemicals, and a bacterium called Zymomonas mobilis. So we, we, we add in those two we get one of those bacteria with our plant hydrolysate, we let it sit for 24 hours, and we get out our fuel. In this case, we're working on making a fuel called isobutanol which is used um, in a lot of, it can be easily uh, mixed in with uh, jet fuels. And it's the, that's a DOE has, has prescribed that as our target. So that's great, right? We make isobutanol. But what we found as we started doing this is we get, we are left over with a whole bunch of stuff, right? And we call this conversion residue or fermentation residue. And so we, we still, you know, once we get the, the bacteria or the yeast out of there, we, we have a lot of material here. So we send it off to, to mass spec people. And we're like, hey, what's in this? It turns out there's a ton of carbon left in there. There's a lot of useful food for other microbes that we could use. And so you could dry it down, sell it for animal feed, burn it for electricity. But we're like, wait, wait, wait we, we love microbes. Bacteria are the greatest organisms on the planet. We can think of a way to use bacteria to convert this waste, leftovers, into a valuable product of some sort. And so that's where uh, another project comes in. So this is the kind of experiments that we do in the Donahue Nagira lab, is we, we try to make chemicals from the leftovers, in this case, conversion residue. So it contains carbohydrates, glycerol, xylose, another sugar, a ton of other carbon sources. I didn't bother to, to list them all. So we're like, well, okay, well, we need to find diverse microbes that can interact with a diverse set of carbon sources and, and nitrogen sources and energy sources. And so we went to our friends at the Madison Metropolitan Sewage District. And this is the Nine Springs water treatment plant over on the east side. And so in there, they, part of the process of cleaning up your wastewater is an anaerobic digester. And so they use microbes to take in all this waste that when you flush the toilet or you know, run the sink, it goes to Nine Springs. One of the first steps is it comes, microbes recognize it and break it down. So we thought, well, these microbes, they're good at recognizing a whole bunch of carbon sources. They're good at breaking stuff down. Maybe they produce something that's of value. And maybe they can do the same thing for our leftovers. And so we took the carbon, the conversion residue, and we took a sample from a very euphemistically sludge <laughs> from the anaerobic digester, and we grew it up in a bioreactor. So this is what the bioreactor looks like in the lab. It's not quite as clean and pretty as the cartoon, but it gets the job done really well. But this is really nice. We can make it anaerobic, where the microbes have no oxygen, they do just fine. And we can control the temperature and the pH and the flow and all of this very important stuff. And so this is where a student named uh, Matt Scarborough, he's a student at the time, now he's a professor of engineering at University of Vermont. But Matt Scarborough had this idea and he wanted to test if these microbes could produce anything of value from this conversion residue. And so this is just to restate what I said. So we have the acid phase digester from the water treatment plant, treated it, we put it into the conversion residue. We call that thin stillage is another fancy name for it. And what he found is that it could produce what's called medium chain fatty acids. So he grew it for weeks or months and he took the products and he measured them. He found these medium chain fatty acids. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. So medium chain fatty acids, or MCFAs, you'll see that abbreviated in the talk that way, uh, they're produced by a process called reverse beta oxidation. Don't worry about that, but I'm gonna refer to it later. It's also called chain elongation. 
but they have valuable uses. They can be used as antimicrobials. They can be used as herbicides. They're precursors for chemicals that are other chemicals derived from fossil fuels. Adhesives, for example, can, be, can play a role in this. And so Matt saw that, okay, well, we can produce these, but maybe we can learn about the microbial communities that produce these MCFAs from the conversion residue, right? We're a bunch of microbiologists upstairs. We love bacteria. We want to know what, what organisms are working together to make this. And so to do that, we used a process that we call metagenomics. And so you've probably heard of sequencing genomes, sequencing DNA, right? That's a big deal. Happened in 97, we sequenced the human genome, or 99. Metagenomics takes that a step further, and it sequences things that we cannot, we have not isolated. And so what we do that is we essentially isolate the DNA. So we, we, we isolate out DNA from a whole lot of microbes. And then we use a couple different technologies of sequencing. One is called Illumina. Illumina is a company. They do short read, 3250 base pairs long of sequence. Or we do long read, PacBio, another company. They do longer read. Those are usually five to 10 kilobases. So we can, we can then isolate the DNA, sequence them out. And then it's kind of like a puzzle. We have to put together all these little pieces of DNA together to construct what we call metagenome assembled genomes, MAGs. The MAGs are a, an indicator of what we think the organisms are within the community. So we can predict what microbes are in the community based on taxonomic analysis. So once we've taken the DNA, sequence it, and we put it back together into these mags, we can then analyze, okay, well, how similar are these mags to everything else that's known that's ever been sequenced? And there are a whole bunch of programs that do this, right? I mean, it would take you forever to try to do this by hand. You can't do it. So there are a bunch of programs that work this way. But it, in addition to basing what organisms are present, we can also identify what genes are present in the mags. Again, using all these kind of tools that are available. But knowing what genes are there tells us what biological functions the community possesses. And so this gives us the power to not only know what product is being made in these microbial communities, but what, what a, not only what bacteria are likely doing it, but what genes do they have that may be doing this process? And then what can we learn about maybe how to enrich those? We'll get to that a little later to produce more of our product. All right, so Matt did this, spent a long time, he assembled a bunch of mags. <coughs> Excuse me. So he ran metagenomics on his analysis, and he identified 10 mags that were both very high quality, meaning we had a lot of sequence that we associate with one of the mags that we think represents an organism, and high abundance. They were the most, when we count how many times each of those like reads appeared, they appeared a bunch of times in our community. So they were the 10 most abundant and highest quality mags. So we're like, all right, great, fantastic. Let's take a look at what they are. And Matt spent a lot of time developing this very elegant but a little complex, so we'll walk through it, diagram of how medium chain fatty acids are being made in the conversion residue. And so he had this group of mags up here. You don't need to know exactly. These are just abbreviations. There's lactobaciliaceae and, and Choreobacteriaceae. But they're just they're mags that represent organisms that can take complex carbohydrates and convert them into simple carbohydrates, like hexoses. They can also then further convert those, that's the green, into things like lactate. So these are, you know, so you have one group of organisms that take those and go to lactate. Then you have other organisms, like this EUB1, that can take lactate and make medium chain fatty acids, C6, C8. That's just the number of carbons that he could identify. And he also found that there was an organism represented by this mag that could go right from carbohydrate to medium chain fatty acid without any intermediate in between. So lactate is the intermediate. 
And so we can put labels on here. So we have some group that can ferment carbohydrates to an intermediate, like lactate. And then we have what we call intermediate chain elongators, where they, they take the intermediate group and they go to the medium chain fatty acid. And then finally, we have carbohydrate chain elongators. So they go from the carbohydrate right to making these medium chain fatty acids without any intermediate in between. So this was what he published. You can go look it up. It's a, it's a really great paper back in 2018. And he said, okay, this explains how medium chain fatty acids are being made when we use conversion residue and the inoculum from the acid phase digester. And so this is a, a more drawn down diagram of the same thing he showed. I've just removed all the mag IDs. So we have simple complex carbohydrates. We have mags that can ferment to intermediates like lactic acid, intermediate chain elongators that take lactic acid to end products, medium chain fatty acids, and then we have carbohydrate chain elongators uh, that go from carbohydrates right to the medium chain fatty acids. So that was on cellulosic ethanol thin stillage, right, this conversion residue. But we thought, okay, as we had more students join, we started to get interest in other types of agro-industrial residues. So, for instance, one thing we're thinking about is, okay, well, we have the cellulosic ethanol. Well, we have, what if we make a synthetic medium that just has xylose? So we, instead of taking it from a fermentation, we just make it up and then feed it to microbes. What would we see if we did that? Well, what if we look at a more traditional starch ethanol, right? This, this corn cob and an and a energy thing that I got online. I like that little icon. But that's starch ethanol, right? So that's using the corn kernels. Much easier to break down, tons of sugar, ready to go. What about that thin stillage? What about that leftover? Do you see the same thing? Then we broadened even more. We had someone who, for some real interesting reason, was interested in manure hydrolysate. So he went out and collected manure quite fresh and was interested in what if we feed that to microbes, right? Manure is a huge agricultural byproduct we have to deal with. Another person in the lab was interested in milk permeate. So when you make different types of cheeses or milks. You, you get all this leftover stuff that's very rich in lactose. What about that? What happens if you feed that? And so this was done by a variety of people. <coughs> and I'll just reference all of the papers here. So all of this work has been published. So what they did is very similar to what Matt Scarborough had done, where they went back to the same acid phase digester from Nine Springs and they added it to each one of their uh, particular agro-industrial residues of interest. So we have, you know, the cellulosic thin stillage that we did. We had our xylose. We had a couple milk permeate because he used two different types of reactor. That's not real important to worry about. We had our manure hydrolysate, starch ethanol, and then the starch ethanol used uh, five different uh, a setting, so adjusting the pH or the temperature, stuff like that. So he was interested in that. So all together, we had this variety of data. So they did the same thing. They did micro metagenomics, they did product analysis, and they have all these individual data sets together. And so then I wanted to come in, and Dan Nagira, who I work with, asked me, he's like, hey, Kevin, I wonder what, if we compare all of these, do they produce the same thing or do they produce different things? So let's look at the products that are made. So what I'm showing here in the, on the, the left is each row is a different um, uh, residue that we're measuring. And then on the, each column is a different product that they measured or reported. And so the you know, yellow is they made a ton of it. Blue is they didn't make much, and white is like couldn't even detect it, or very, very, very small. So what was really, really interesting is neither is nearly all the reactors accumulated lactic and succinic acid as well as some ethanol. So those first three lines, you can see there's color in nearly everything, and roughly, you know, a lot of them on the high, especially that milk permeate. All reactors 
accumulated short chain fatty acids. Those are acetic and propionic, C2, C3. So three carbons, two carbons. But all but, in all but two of the starch ethanol, so remember he did, he did multiple different conditions. So all but two accumulated the medium chain fatty acids, butyric, hexanoic, oxanoic, C4, C6, C8. This was kind of surprising. We didn't really expect, given the variety of media that we were using, that we would see this similar of products. So this made us question, this, this was very interesting. All right, well, what about, oh yeah, these are also worth money. So that's something else. We always are thinking about what can we focus on that will make people more likely to use this stream instead of something that's gonna burn it or, or not make, uh, or not produce a biofuel. Then we thought, okay, well, we know the products are generally the same. What about the mags? What about the, the organisms that are present? So they all started from the same place. They didn't start at the same time, but they're roughly this, they all came from the same source. So we went through and we did metagenomics. And so we have, here I've just added the same chart. I've just put the number of mags that we identified for each one in parentheses. So some we had 38, 68, a few had you know seven and two and two over here. So they varied. So we identified all the mags and 10 were just in the inoculum that we measured. All told, we identified 240 total mags <coughs> from the inoculum and all the experiments. So that's a lot. And then we thought, okay, well, how many are similar? So there's a tool called DREP, and it's just referenced down here. And what DREP does is it looks at the metagenomic, the, the, you can think of a genome, the mag, and it compares it to every other mag in your set. So all 240 compared against all 240. And it looks for any that are so similar, it believes it's from the same, represents the same organism. Remember, mags are just representations of organisms. And so we run DREP, we're like, all right, how many are gonna be similar? Is it gonna be half of them are the same, which would suggest, okay, they'll, it's all the same organism doing everything, or is it gonna be four of them are the same? Well, it turns out only about 23 were identical. So this was a number that was much, much smaller than we were anticipating. So we got 217 representative mags. That means there's 217 unique mags representing unique organisms among all of the experiments. Keep in mind that this was not what we expected because the products are all the same. So it suggests that the mags from different reactors are not identical. And we wondered, okay, well, would the microbial communities be influenced more based on reactor condition, feedstock, metabolic function? We needed to look into this more. So the next thing we did is we plotted all these mags on this kind of complex looking chart called a, 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 an NMDS or, or non-metric non dimensional scaling or something. I can't even remember it now. Should have put it on the, the slide. Anyway, the idea is that each dot represents a mag from one of those conditions that we, one of those 217. The closer two dots are, the more similar they are. And so what we see, and they're color-coded by where they were identified. And then I've labeled them on there too, which, which residue. So what's interesting is that we see that mags that cluster together tend to originate from the same condition. In fact, the starch ethanol, which had, remember, different reactor conditions, those mags are all clustering together. That means they're more similar to each other than they are to anything else. Dramatic lighting. Also, we had three, the starch ethanol one, milk permeate one, and xylose. They had identical reactor conditions, but the mags you can see are clearly nowhere near clustering together. So if it was reactor condition influenced, we would expect those to be all clustered together, but that's not what we saw. What we saw is that the residue influenced the microbial communities more than the reactor conditions. 
So that's actually really cool for me because I'm like, well, I care a lot more about what's in these residues and how they're using them than I do about whatever we, however we program our, our bioreactor. So like, all right, we know it's the, the individual bioreactor conditions weren't really influencing. It was the residue influencing the mags to produce the same products. And so we looked at the metagenomes, the 217, <coughs> excuse me, and we saw diversity. So we saw, these are just the summary of the taxonom tax taxonomic groups that we saw. You know, 24 genera, 12 families, 13 orders. So it's pretty diverse, much more diverse than we initially thought. We thought, well, okay, well, how does this fit into our model? Right? So we know that they produce medium chain fatty acids. We know that Matt Scarborough showed in, in cellulosic conversion residue that they have this pattern. Do the other mags fit into this? Is that the cellular function maintained, but the organism represented doing that is different? So to do that, we decided to do some machine learning. And so Machine learning is a way to use a computer to run a bunch of tests and try to figure out an answer to a question. In this case, what we wanted to do is, well, can we classify all of these mags, these 217 mags, into one of these four functional groups? So ferment to intermediates, intermediate chain elongator, a carbohydrate chain elongator, or a fourth one uninvolved. And that fourth one was needed because we couldn't assume that every single mag was dedicated to making medium chain fatty acids. They're probably also doing other stuff that's harder for us to measure. And so we, we make a, a training set. Now a training set is one where, in my case, it's ground truth. And so I went and I looked for sequenced, isolated organisms that had published biochemical microbio, my, microbiological data that they belonged and performed one of those four functional groups. And then that was my, my genomes. I, these genomes definitely do this, these genomes do that, these genomes do this. But then how do I, you know, how do I take that and like make it biologically, you know, trainable? So we identified homologs of key fermentation pathways. And this was a, the a product of, a, of another former student, Abel Engel, who's now a postdoc, I think somewhere, but I don't remember where he ended up. But Abel graduated last year, but he wrote a program to look at all of the genes in these central carbon metabolism. So that involves glycolysis and a bunch of pathways. It's not important to, to, to memorize all this. A bunch of pathways that feed into or feed off of glycolysis or pyruvate oxidation. Remember, reverse beta oxidation is what produces medium chain fatty acids. We also had direct butyric acid production, lactic acid utilization. So we, we looked and we looked at, he developed a pipeline to identify homologs of all of these genes across all the genomes and eventually all the mags that we wanted. But in our case now, we're just looking at this training set of mags. And this is what he found. So again, this is for the mags, but it's the same thing for the, the genome training set. Each row represents a particular gene or a particular mag or chromosome. Each column is a, a homolog and then a color just means if it's present or not based on his algorithm. And so each, you can see I've separated them into the different functional groups and the colors are just to separate them out and make it a little, little prettier to look at. So what we could do now that we have this is I could go through one by one and try to pick out by myself and say, okay, well, this one has glycolysis, but not this one and this one, it must be in this group. But that would take me way, way too long. So this is where machine learning comes in. Machine learning can do this stuff for us. And so I used uh, what's called a classification algorithm to place the genomes into groups. And so this is a, Actually not, it's, so I wanted to test. So there are multiple machine learning algorithms that you could use. One of the things I wanted to do, because I don't know what the best one is, is I wanted a way to test them. So this is where the training set comes in. You're using your training set to train the model, to find the best one, and then you use that model to examine your, your real data. 
So in this case, you could think of a classification. You just want to split it into two groups. In my case, I wanted to split each one into one of four groups. And so we can evaluate those using tools. So one of them, I'm just going to go through three of them. These are the ones that seem to work the best for, for what I was doing. And one is called a decision tree. You probably have done something like this, maybe in elementary, maybe in an in intro bio when you're doing a dichotomous key, trying to classify this thing has four legs, so it's over here. It has you know, fur and gives birth to live young, so it's a mammal. It's just a way to separate out. So in this case, we could take, okay, gene A, present, absent for each, each organism. Then we go to gene B, present or absent. Then we go to gene C, present or absent. So you get this pattern that you're like, okay, well, this mag belonged to this. All of these had this pattern. We could use that then on the unknowns and try to place them in there. The problem is it's only doing it one time. It takes a long time. It could be wrong about some things. So that's a decision tree. And then another modification of a decision tree cleverly enough, is called a random forest. It's essentially a collection of decision trees. Get it? A forest? Uh -huh. So it basically runs it a bunch of times, runs decision trees a bunch of times on a data set, and then averages out the result and finds the majority winner and gives you the result. It's a more robust version of a decision tree. But one thing computer scientists who develop these algorithms hate is slowness. So random forests are faster than decision trees, but they can still take a while. So the algorithm that I ended up using that was by far the best is something called Light GBM, or Light Gradient Boosting Machine. You don't really need to know much about it. I love this little figure. But it basically looks for all possible classifications. So it's similar to random forest, but it's much, much faster, and it can run much, much more tests. And this means that it's much more accurate. So how did we determine how accurate each of these was? Well, we have our training set. I know which group they should belong in. So I ran the model, and I saw how many times did it get it right, or did it get it wrong. And running light GBM gave me the most, in fact, 100% of the correct answers. So this was the model I used. So I trained it on the known genomes that I found. Now I have this model with this light GBM. And so I, that's just what I said here, sorry. So I used the statistics to see. So I used light GBM. And then we went through, <coughs> excuse me, using that same model we trained. Now we run it on our mags. And so first, 217, I wanted to reduce a little bit more. And so we only looked at the most abundant mags that were greater than 1% of the population and at least one sample across all of those um, experiments that we did. So we dropped to 131, but still a whole bunch, good representation. We identified the homologs of key fermentation pathways exactly as before. And then we used our machine learning algorithm to predict the classification of the mags into one of those four functional groups. So this is what we found. So this is just a bar plot. I'm showing the total number of mags that were classified into each of the four. So you see the majority of them were in the ferment to intermediate. So that's the one that takes the carbohydrates and goes to lactic acid or in a potentially ethanol, though we didn't observe much ethanol in our, in our uh, uh, reactors. And we have a couple, you know, see the 17 and 12 and the other two, and then uninvolved, 39. So that means there's probably 39 mags that represent organisms that we're not really sure what they're doing, but we don't think they're contributing to making medium chain fatty acids. So what if we break it down by reactor? Well, what we can see is that, to my eye, quickly, these are just the different reactors, other than the inoculum, which makes sense because it's not making anything there, it's just eating stuff. It all kind of looks, there's a similar pattern, right? Most of them are in the fermentation, the blue, there's uninvolved, and then there's some in the middle. But they all kind of look, except for some of these down here, remember those he played with the conditions, they all kind of fit that pattern. So this made me think, well, it sure looks like they're performing the same functional groups 
but probably using different organisms to do that, the same functional uh, roles. So we can go back to my little chart here, and now I've placed on these little uh, tables, and so each table then represents one of the experiments or the inoculum, and then up here are the, um, the taxonomic group, and then I've just labeled how abundant each one was in that particular group. So you can see in the inoculum it had no mags that we identified representing organisms capable of producing intermediates, that's fine, but everything else had at least one that could do this. But they didn't all belong to the same thing. A lot of them were in this lactobaciliaceae, for example, but some of them were varied. We see the same thing, a similar thing here, whoops, similar thing here. So what we say is it shows while common biological functions are found throughout these bioreactors, the different microbes present perform the same function. So it's not the same microbes, but they do the same functions. And that was completely not what we expected at all. So we're going to go through this one by one briefly and just kind of go over, uh, zoom in a little bit here. And so the interesting thing here is <coughs> most of them had an ability to ferment into intermediates, lactic acid being the intermediate in these reactors. Lactobaciliaceae, these are lactobacilli, things involved in cheese making, lactic acid, lactic bacteria, and everything but the xylose, but also bifidobacteria, other ones had examples that were present. So while lactobacillus was the most abundant, it wasn't it's definitely not the only microbe responsible for performing this particular functional category, right? And I think it highlights how important it is to look at more than one experiment. So if we look at the cellulosic, if we had quit after Matt Scarborough, we would have seen two organisms. Like, all right, well, it's the, you know, ato, the atopobaceaceae and the lactobaciliaceae. But Looking at others, we see, oh no, there's a bacilli that can do it, there's bifidobacteriaceae, you know. Having this broad data set broadened our understanding of what microbes are capable of doing this cellular function. So this is an interesting, this is the intermediate to end product. So in this case, we see, unlike the previous one, there's not one overwhelming winner, right? There's not one that's kind of present. It's kind of thrown throughout. Some of them prefer one group of bacteria, some prefer another, some prefer another one. And so it's interesting to find that there are then a variety, even more variety that can perform this function, converting lactic acid to medium chain fatty acids, than we would have thought, again, looking at just one or two of these experiments. But looking at the broad spectrum, we can now get a better understanding of these mags. And one thing that would be very interesting is to go in and look at what organisms these mags are predicted to represent, maybe try to isolate them, try to do some actual biochemistry on them. That would be super, super interesting. The one group that uh, was relatively novel to Matt Scarborough's initial study was the ability to take carbohydrates and go right to medium chain fatty acids. And this is more similar to the first, where there, most of them are these lacnospiriaceae here, where you see there's a lot of variety here. But you also have a couple others that we identified in some of these other manure and milk permeate samples. What's interesting is down here, so you don't see anything down here. Those also did not really produce much medium chain fatty acids. If you remember from that initial color chart way back, there were some in the corner that had white down there. Those were those. Those were those experiments. So it kind of fits with what we expected. But it really suggests that these proteobacteria and bacilli, we had no idea that members of those taxonomic groups, they shouldn't be able to do this. So maybe we're wrong. I mean, that's fine. This is all bioinformatic, prediction-based, homolog-based. But it'd be very interesting now. We have a, we have a new hypothesis for someone to take into the lab and test and see if they can do this. 
So how can we kind of verify the machine learning? So one thing to take a little bit a step back is, let's think about uh, the enzymes responsible. So this is work really um, done a lot by uh, Kevin Walters in the lab. He, he identified this, and I'm just borrowing it for this example. So we have this one protein, electron fl flava protein, but it can interact with two different proteins, and that affects its function. So if it forms a heterodimer with a lactate dehydrogenase, it can be involved in lactic acid utilization. However, if it forms a complex with an acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, a different enzyme, it uh, performs this chain elongation. So now we can hypothesize, okay, so we know that we have mags that we predicted to be able to both utilize lactic acid to do chain elongation or to just do chain elongation from carbohydrates. Would we see homologs that match that prediction? So we would predict for ones that would utilize lactic acid to produce chain elongation. We should see homologs of both lactic, lactic dehydrogenase and acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, right? Because it can do both functions. Whereas mags that we predict go right from the sugars, right to medium chain fatty acid, don't care about lactate, they shouldn't have lactate dehydrogenase. There's no need for it. If our predictions are correct, So let's look first at the intermediate chain elongators. These are the ones that take lactic acid and go to chain elongation. And so what we found, blue is homolog was present, white is not. It actually has homologs of both of them, just as we predicted, right? It has to utilize lactic acid, has to deal with it, and then it has to also perform chain elongation. So those are just three examples. And if we look at carbohydrate chain elongators, these are ones that go right from the sugar right to medium chain fatty acids. They don't care about lactate. They don't want anything to do with lactate. They don't have the lactate utilization gene present. So this is a nice, completely exterior way that we use to kind of validate this machine learning. It, it fit with our assumptions and our predictions. <coughs> so in summary, we found that a common microbial ecology model can explain medium chain fatty acid productions across a variety of very different agro-industrial residues. So the specific microbes are not the same, which was completely unexpected, but the different taxa fill the required functional groups for these ecological models across feedstocks. There's a typo in my second one, but the machine learning provide a tool and a valuable platform for classification of mags into these different groups. And so I think it's really, really cool, I was shocked by this, that bacteria find a way to do what they need to do. And it's probably one thing I would love to spend more time on is what aspects of each of these residues enriched particular microorganisms versus other microorganisms. There has to be something in there that produced, they all started from the same junk, right? It was all the same stuff, the sludge from the <laughs> wastewater treatment. What in the different residues contributed to the enrichment of the different taxa? That's something I think would be really, really cool to see. I'll just end by, I recently just ran the machine learning model on additional data from Kevin Walters. And I'm happy to say it still works great. He got exactly what he expected, close enough. And so it's, it's, it's good. And like I said, this is published, so you feel free to go read it. These are all the people who worked on it. Abel, Kevin Walters, Nathan Fortney, Matt Scarborough, Tim and Dan. I want to thank the, the lab. Thanks, Scott, for the opportunity to chat. Our funding sources, so the Joint Genome Institute did, all of the, did a lot of the sequencing. They're a DOE-funded group out in California. They do a lot of our high-throughput sequencing. National Dairy Council, National Institutes of Food and Agriculture, the Department of Energy for GOBRC, and of course the staff for keeping the building running. So with that, I'm happy to take questions.
this one one result of this maybe is that it may be okay that you have these microbial communities, you don't care so much about what's in them because eventually they'll figure out what you know among the community they'll figure out what's going to be the final end product. So you don't have to isolate a specific microbe and then try to Mm -hmm. Spoken like an engineer. <laughs> so that's the engineering side doesn't care about the microbes. They care about the product. Whereas the microbiologists upstairs care about the microbes that are doing it because we wanted to learn. The thing at the end, it would be very interesting if we knew that we, what chemical, what part of the residue enriched for some of these. You know, if we want to get the best of this, like, are there taxa that we could design the ideal community? For anything, it would take it and just go with it. Maybe, maybe not. But you could imagine like, okay, well, if you change the pH to this and add this salt, now you're gonna enrich for these particular organisms we know are important to this. So some level, but yeah, you're right. It, at, at another level, you're like, well, as long as you give it the stuff, it'll, it'll do what it needs to do. Back at the beginning, I know you said there were two different fermenters for the back at the beginning. One is a traditional swirly one, and the other was a um, you know, it's like a upflow reactor, so it's a little different instead of cycling out the material as often, it kind of settles and then gets removed or something. It's a different design that he was testing. And I, he did not publish on that aspect. So he published on the other reactor. Would that be associated with some particular? Oh, probably. Yeah, absolutely. It probably enriches for different things, yeah. It's producing the other chain of fatty So that would be milk permeate two in yeah. this diagram. So there are differences if you look at the chain carbohydrate chain elongator and the intermediate, the yeah. fermentation, it's all the same, but the, the other two, there are definite differences. And so the reactor design can also, not only, so all the stuff that you can affect, the temperature, pH, retention time, all that stuff. They're all anaerobic? Mm -hmm. They're all anaerobic. Like they're, they're as anaerobic as we can make them. That's what I can say, right? Faith, you agree. So I should say, I don't, go in the lab anymore. So this is all what I get from the researchers. <laughs> but yeah, they're all anaerobic. Because that's the anaerobic digester is anaerobic. Yeah, I just didn't want to say it. Mm -hmm. So a big conclusion was that the residue mattered more than the reactor conditions. Is there any native microbes from the residues that might be carried into these experiments? I believe that most of the residues were sterilized, if possible. I know that because I know when he autoclaved the dairy manure, it was nobody went to lab. Got it. But I think that they filtered it. So I think they tried to remove any native microbes that were present. Now, I don't know how similar the other, I think if there anything was there, they probably got swapped out, swamped out by whatever we dumped in there. That's a great question, though. Yeah, I didn't say that. I think that they sterilized the material before starting it. <laughs> so the so you found two hundred. I don't know how many elements there. I don't remember what classification. Different microbes, right? You know, depends on which condition. Mm -hmm. Did you see? Yeah, we did 10 of those, 10, 10 different isolates of the slow. We found 10 mags that were abundant enough to specify in the inoculum. The problem is the inoculum. Those, those the ones that were invented. Yeah, a lot of those were present in other things and the others. The inoculum is incredibly complex, and the more complex the sample, the harder it is to get really good mags because. Again, it's like a puzzle without a picture. So you're trying to put all these pieces together. And if it's, if there's 
thousands of organisms, it's much, much harder to separate them out for the programs versus before, you know, if you had 30, it's much easier to say, okay, well, he's one of these 30 that fit. Did you do any kind of other, like, like ribosomal RNA or conserved protein analysis or something? No, just yeah, I was just elements. wondering how many microbes were actually in that sludge at, at the waste I don't know what the answer is. You, now I'm not sure what, how many we think are in there. I think people have done 16S and 16S has its, so 16S RNA sequencing is a way of, are there like thousands or are there like? Hundreds? My guess would be lower than a hundred. Like it's still an environment that's enriched for microorganisms. So it's an anaerobic environment with this, a particular TH. So we, we don't think we get any methanologens, any archaea. We see no archaea. And so we, it's still enriched for something, but it's enriched for a particular wastewater just by design that it's bringing in. So I think, I don't know, I'll say 50 just off the top of my head. But then you got like 200 here. That actually must have been they might be small and we just can't detect them. Yeah, that's what I, I, didn't know. I mean, our assumption is every organism started from that inoculum. Now, maybe some were carried over. Faith is saying we don't, I'm not sure of it. Well, ecological, everything is everywhere and then the environment is selecting. So you're like selecting. Exactly, I was yeah. just wondering what was, how many were actually- We were, I was hoping to get a, I was hoping to find everything that we detected later in the inoculum samples, but I think they're just too complex to try to, to try to tease that out. And we've seen that, but we've done a lot more of the inoculum work. And if you're looking for specific organisms, you know, should be there, it's much easier to find those. But if you're trying to just de novo identify everything that's there, it's much, much harder. Do you have a question online? Um, is it easy to separate these different products? I medium chain fatty acids uh, can, so that they can be used by industry. Um, can you tune or control the microbes to get a more homogeneous product? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, the separation and is something that we are actively working on. So we are not, a lot of, you know, ethanol could be easily distilled. These medium chain fatty acids, I think there's ways that people in the lab are working on and other labs are working on getting them out of the solution. We detected them this with mass spec um, or GCMS, so we would just take the the liquid and, and squeeze it in and see the, the atoms. Uh, but that's a great point that I think we need to spend more time thinking about. Um, but we can part of this, yes, is trying to enrich to make it more homogeneous. Get if we want C8, like how do we change the reactor condition? It's something that Kevin Walters is working on now, and, and Faith as well. Uh, how do we change these reactor conditions to get a particular, more of a particular product? There are also groups on campus. The Ventrelli Lab is working on kind of the flip side where they're engineering a, a community from 16 known organisms and seeing what combination produces the best product that they want. So there's two different ways we're going about this. We take a sludge, an unknown ish, and we let nature enrich, or you can start with known, but then you're missing out anything that might be new. So there's pluses and minuses to, to both. But the enrichment question, that's a, that's a great, great question. I don't have uh, a definite answer for, but I think it's definitely something that's on our radar and we have begun to give more thought to. So much All right, thank you. See you all back in two weeks.